pray before we begin, or as we begin. Father, we're thankful for the day that you've given to us. Thank you for the time we've been able to be together. Thank you for your promise to be with us now through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about the third angel's message, but by two illustrations, Abraham and uh, David. They were both justified by faith. In fact, we could probably go to Romans chapter 4 and uh, read about them here. Uh, the first six verses. The uh, Verse 1 says, What shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? And the answer, of course, is nothing. For if Abraham had just been justified by works, he has something of which to boast, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And then if we drop down to verse um, 6, he uses David as another of the illustrations. Just as David also described the blessedness to whom God does not impute, uh, impute righteousness um, apart from work. Or he does, I should say. So David has looked at from a negative standpoint, Abraham as positive. And we'll look at something now that you think of justification. I don't think you'll ever forget it. <laughs> We're going to look at it from the standpoint, just as if I, and we'll get into that now, just as if I, and uh, here we go. Just as if I, now this is from God's standpoint. God looks at you and me, if we've accepted Christ by faith, just as if I always believed. Amen. He looks at us just as if I always obeyed. He looks at us just as if I never sinned. Can you imagine that? Amen. I, it's, it's hard to grasp, but it's true. And uh, David and, and uh, uh, Abraham are illustrations of this. They are the two main characters in the New Testament talking about justification by faith in Christ alone. And, uh, <clears throat> and we've, all, we've been going through Revelation 14, 12, about here that those who keep the faith of Jesus. Well, Abraham and David kept that faith too, and they were justified by it. Um, with with uh, Abraham, you know, he left the uh, left Ur, recorded in Genesis chapter 12, and it said he would be a blessing to the whole earth. Maybe we ought to go back there and just read that. Um, that's the beginning of it, first time that that he was called out of uh, out of Ur. By the way, Ur was a, a place that uh, was probably as modern as some, as some of our cities today. It had running water, it had toilets. It had, I mean, it was it was quite a place. And he, Abraham was a wealthy man. His family was exceedingly wealthy, and he left. God called him to separate from his family which he didn't right away. He was still taking care of his father, which was a good thing. And they went to, the, well, they were just north of uh, Judah, or what became Israel. And he waited until his father died before he moved south. And then still things did not happen because Lot was there, and Lot finally made a choice to go pitch his tent toward uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And then it was that God showed Abraham more fully what he was talking about. But Abraham was standing in the middle of what we know today as um, Israel. And God says, look, every direction that you can see, and everything you can see, I'm going to give to you and to your descendants. Then in chapter 7 of the book of Acts, when he was, when, um, when uh, Paul, or Saul, was consenting, consenting to the destruction of who? Who was the last one at the end of the 70 weeks? Stephen. Pardon me? Stephen. I, I didn't hear. Stephen? Oh, thank you. Yes, Stephen. And Stephen reminded them, and then he told them, he says, Abraham did not have so much 
land to set his foot on. Um, so God was, God was talking to him about something greater than real estate in the Middle East. In fact, we're told in Romans chapter 4 that uh, God promised him the entire world. And then in chapter uh, 11 of uh, Hebrews, that God had promised in the city that God had built, the foundation built in that city. So the whole world is involved in the promise to Abraham. But in, in uh, chapter 12, we see the beginning of this, when God told him out of Ur, and uh, began in the gospel, the first uh, few verses, but I want to drop down to uh, two. He said, I'll make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you. And in you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And so Abraham left with that promise. But so this, this promise of, uh, that was given to Abraham would be a blessing to everybody in, in the world. Every family that's come into existence. Now, in the, the next thing we have at the end of this time was when Isaac was offered. And that's in chapter 22 of Genesis. Remember, was, they were walking up the hill, up the mountain, and Isaac said, uh, we've, got, we've got kindling, we've got a fire. But where's the land? And Abraham said, God will provide himself. Now, neither one of them understood what that meant until after he laid his son on the stone slab and was ready to kill him. And the angel interrupted him and it was a lamb or a ram in his stead. And it's the first, first real clear picture of uh, what the father and the son went through for us. The agony that went on between these two is a picture into the heart of God. And, uh, but Isaac, Isaac was a young man, he could have gotten away. He was, you know, his, Father was what, 100 and over 100, yeah, almost 120 years old. And uh, he, he could have gotten this time. There would have been no problem whatsoever. But he was obedient to God. He loved God and he loved his father. And he was willing to die. And Abraham had to believe that God would raise him from the dead. And that's what we find that, again in Hebrews 11 that he believed that his only begotten son would be raised. And uh, so they went through it until right at the last minute God interrupted him. But Abraham had to go through the experience. God had called him to be the father of the faithful. And in order to do that, he had to believe against his own feelings. Mm -hmm. And he did. And he passed the test. And now that's all we hear about him, what, you know, what he did, the good things he did. But these are acts of faith that, uh, that he went through. Righteousness by faith. That's in chapter 15 of, uh, of this book. And uh, we'll just read a little bit. Abraham was getting older. In fact, he was old when God called him out <clears throat> in his 70s. And then uh, he was 75 years old when God told him he was going to have a, a child. And uh, it didn't happen. And so he thought, well, maybe God's going to use my hired hand to him, his child. But God informed him, no, he said, you come out and look at the stars, count the stars, and he said, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And that's in chapter 15 of uh, Genesis, and verse 6 says, and he believed in the Lord, and he accounted to him for righteousness. So here we have the first time that righteousness by faith is used in the scripture, or spelled out, I should say. And uh, then he he asked God again in verse 8, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And so God told him, he said, well, you uh, offer some sacrifices, and I'll come down, I'll walk through the body parts that you lay out. And uh, so he did that. And during the night, and then there were some, uh, <clears throat> some uh, animals came along, so he was chasing the the birds away, birds of prey, so they wouldn't eat the body parts and the sacrifices. And then God came down, and the important thing here is that 
as God walked through these carcasses, pathway, evidently on either side of the pathway, and God was telling Abraham that if I fulfill, if I do not fulfill my promise, let me become as these dead carcasses. He was willing to put his life on the line for his word. And Abraham says, Lord, I believe. <laughs> but it still took him some time to really come to grips with, with this. Then, and God came through as a, a burning torch and a smoking oven. And then the everlasting covenant was, uh, was promised to him. And, uh, and in chapter 15 and also 17. And then Isaac was promised again. But still there was no fruit that Abraham could see. So they went to Egypt. It was, they, they, needed, uh, they needed to get some food to live and that type of thing. And, but the point here is it got 50 years that God was working with Abraham. How long has he been working with you? <laughs> he will work for as long as it takes. So he's not going to give up. Not going to give up. Uh, Abraham, uh, no, we're, we're, we like to think most of the positives with Abraham, but uh, he was a bald-faced liar. <laughs> and uh, uh, when, uh, remember, he, he lied when they went to Egypt, and his wife must have been a beautiful woman, and he told her, now you tell Pharaoh, Pharaoh's going to see you, and going to see your beauty, and you tell him that you're not my wife. Remember that? And so she did. She was beautiful. She told him that. And he took her, he was going to put her in the harem. I don't know if he got her that far or not. But he couldn't lay his hand on her because God interrupted. He said, don't you touch that woman. You're dead meat. <clears throat> and so he got mad and he chased Abraham out of Egypt for that lie. And he said, he told me, you know, well, the, the question is, was she his sister? Yes. Yeah, half sister. But he was using truth as a vehicle for a lie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that possible for us to do? Yes. Yeah, we need to be careful some, some of those, uh, in some of those areas. But uh, this was showing his lack of faith. And so the next time, uh, because Sarah could not have a child, neither one of them could. They could not produce a child. And so Sarah said, well, you take Hagar, and, and that will be the promise, the child from that, from that union. So he dutifully did. And then as time went on, Sarah became furious. She was jealous and angry because, well, Hagar, I think, was eight years old too, because she had this child, and uh, see what I got, you don't, you don't have anything. And so she, Sarah said, you've got to get rid of this woman. Now, do you think this pained Abraham to get rid of his son? And even the woman, there, there must have been some feeling there for Hagar, and, but especially the son, because he thought that this son would be the one to inherit. And, uh, but that was not to be, so he had to send him away. But God even blessed, uh, blessed that son, uh, Ishmael. Uh, he had 12, 12 uh, children, and so he had 12 tribes of Ishmael, 12 tribes of Israelites, and uh, 12 apostles. <laughs> uh, I don't know all of the reasons for this, but there's 12, 12, and 12. All three groups looked to Abraham as their father. Muslims, although they believed that it was not Isaac that was offered, it was Ishmael. And in fact, uh, some of them don't even have a map of Israel in their map, on their maps that obliterated everything. And uh, but now God blessed them, and uh, uh, although, and I think many of them will be saved, but uh, there's going to be a lot of them not. But the problem we're having in the Middle East today goes right back to Abraham. He's the, he's the father of the problems. And uh, so, you know, we're in a fix, but God is going to work this thing out too. I believe Abraham is going to be in heaven. No doubt about it. But he lied again. He didn't learn his lesson. It was the same lie. He went south. He went back to Canaan. They had to go south. And in fact, I think, um, let's go to chapter 20. This is an interesting thing that happened <clears throat> with uh, Abraham. He told Sarah the same thing. He said, you, you tell the king that you're my sister. And so she did. And again, the king was interrupted by God. 
don't you lay a hand on that woman. And uh, verse 5 says, Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart. This is the king speaking to God. And my innocence, my hands, I have done this. And God said to him, in a dream, yes, I know that you, you've done this in integrity of your heart. For I also withhold you from sinning against me, therefore I did not let you touch her. Now therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet. Now listen, he was a liar, but God still called him a prophet. Mm -hmm. Then notice what he says next. And he, speaking of his prophet, Abraham, he will pray for you. <laughs> this is after he'd been lying with bald face, you know. And, uh, but God was still using him. I'm not saying we need to go out and lie. I'm not, he was totally wrong with this. But God was still working on him, bringing these things out in the open so that he could even see, him, so Abraham could see how, how corrupted he was. And then finally the test came, and this is Hebrews 11, I mentioned this before. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. And that term, only begotten son, is identical with Genesis, or not Genesis, but Je uh, John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so by this, we under, was, was he the only begotten son of Abraham? No. no. Isaac, and then he had several after that. He had, uh, when he married Keturah, uh, he had many children from her, and, uh, or by her. But so the, the only begotten son, had, it has to do with something uniqueness, because Isaac was unique. They could not have a, ch a child. God worked a miracle and brought, them, brought Isaac into, the, into existence. But how is Abraham remembered? Well, we remember him mostly by his acts of faith, by believing in God and the everlasting covenant. God said it would be for an everlasting possession, so inherent in that is the promise of eternal life. You can't, you can't inherit something eternally unless, you have, unless you're given eternal life. And so all that happened with Abraham was a promise of the future. And uh, so, but these are the things we remember. Uh, the promise of Isaac, he believed, and Isaac was offered. These are the things that we remember. Now, let's consider David. I'm not going to go into the details here. Just, if you want to read it another time, 2 Samuel 11 talks about it. David, Bathsheba, and Uriah. Uriah was probably the best soldier that... David had. He was a Hittite. He, wasn't, he was not a Jewish man. And uh, you know the story. Uh, Bathsheba became pregnant from David. And so David called Uriah home and sent him, sent him home. He wouldn't go home. So I would imagine David began to panic. So he got Uriah drunk. And even in his drunken state, he wouldn't go home. <laughs> he said, my men are out there fighting and dying. And that's where I need to be. I'm not going to go home. And so David had to do something because uh, there were some telltale signs that were coming on. <laughs> and uh, so he, he said, uh, thought to himself, well, I'm going to send a letter to Joab and have him kill Uriah. So he wrote his wrote the letter, and here again, the honesty of Uriah, he, he could have opened the note and read it, but he didn't do it. He handed, he handed his death decree to Joab. And David said, put him up, right up in front, fighting, and then draw, withdraw the men. And Joab did that. Joab should not have done that, but he did it. And, uh, and Uriah was killed. And then David thought he was home free, but he wasn't. That some died. Uh, ang uh, great uh, anxiety and, and hurt again, but his whole family was messed up. Uh, Absalom tried to take the kingdom, another one tried to take it uh, away from David. And, uh, and then even when, when uh, Absalom was hung in a tree, and uh, David didn't know this, but he told jo Joab, when you see him, he said, don't, uh, don't, uh, don't kill him. But he did. And, uh, but the, then he said, oh Abraham, or oh Absalom, Absalom, all oh, that I had died for you in your place. 
and again the picture of God in heaven. In fact, I want to go to Ezekiel 28 just briefly. We're not going to talk about Lucifer except one point. And uh, in Ezekiel 28, and when it talks about Lucifer, the uh, it talks about him walking in the, the stones of fire and that sort of thing. And you were perfect in all your ways from the day that you were created. And that's you know starting in about 12, 13, 14 in through there. But notice what it says in verses, uh, verses 11 and 12. Moreover, the Lord, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. Say to him, Thus says the Lord your God, you were, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone which you're covering. And then it names, <clears throat> names the stones. This is a statement about Lucifer. What is a lamentation? It's a, fa a funeral dirge, weeping and wailing for the death of someone. And this is the attitude that God had toward Lucifer when Lucifer turned against God. God wept over him. He loved Lucifer. But the goodness of God could not lead Lucifer to repent. And so he's going to be eternally lost. But God was trying to save him. And here we see God weeping over him. This is what happened with David. I think David is the closest example of this experience that we know. When, when, Ab when Absalom was dead, David wept over him and wanted to take his place. And I believe God would have taken Lucifer's place. I believe Christ would have died for Lucifer uh, had he repented. When sin came into existence, there had to be death. And it had to be the death of Jesus Christ. But I think Lucifer could have been saved had he, had he turned around. But he didn't do it. So we don't have to speculate on that. <clears throat> but anyhow, when, uh, coming back now to David, um, he was trying to cover this up. And then, uh, in three, three points, adult, he was guilty of adultery, a terrible liar, and a murderer. And this, these were premeditated. This wasn't something where he just got caught. And then you remember, the non-canonical prophet came to him, Nathan came to him, and gave, told him a story. And uh, you remember what the story was? This man, the sheep man had, had uh, had some sheep, and, and he went to his neighbor and stole another sheep. And David, because he was a shepherd when he was younger, really became angry. And there was a death decree. And when he expressed himself, Nathan said, Thou art the man. And that broke, that broke uh, David. Instead of killing Nathan, he repented. And he never, his life really changed after that, I'm sure for the good, but also he was troubled the rest of his life because of what he had done. But David's grief for sin was exceedingly bitter. And the effects of that sin were visible upon his outward appearance. It says his bones grew old. And then 32, let's go to Psalm 32, it's a tremendous passage. If you ever wonder about uh, how to pray uh, in confession and repentance, this is a tremendous one to, to read. And thank you. The, uh, chapter 32. Let me get there. And there are other ones too. The 51st Psalm is another good one. But in verse 32, he's beginning with verse 1, he says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. This is what Paul was quoting in, uh, in chapter 4 of the book of Romans. And whose, in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned. Vitality was turned into the drop of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. 
I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And you forgave me. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. Amen. So he recognized that uh, recognized that, that God had forgiven him. But he never got over it completely. He knew he was forgiven, but uh, the family situation was so bad that it, it uh, chewed on him for quite some time. <clears throat> but he was drying up like a drought in the summertime. And no, no remedy could be fine, uh, could he find until he made full confession to God. And now, what we want to look at here is uh, how God tre treats the repentant believer by what he says, by what he says about David. <coughs> and I've got it written here. You can go ahead and, and uh, look it up. But First Kings, chapter three, verse fourteen. This is what God told Solomon after he was king. He said, if you will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father walked, then I will lengthen or prolong your days. Now that's interesting. Now we go to the next king that came along, a corrupt one. This is Jeroboam. And this is what God told him. I tore the kingdom away from the house of David and I gave it to you, and yet you have not been as my servant David. Now notice this next phrase. Who kept my commandments. Who followed me with all his heart. To do that only what was right in my eyes. Didn't he kill someone? Didn't he commit adultery? Didn't he lie? What's going on here? How can God say this? This is fascinating. Notice in Ezekiel, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, none of his sins that he has committed shall be mentioned against him. Amen. This is the case with David and with Abraham. You'll never find a single negative in Scripture after they were converted, of God condemning them or pointing out even any sin. I'm sure they were not perfect. But God looked at them as though they had never sinned. It's amazing. Now, does he do the same thing with us? Yes. Huh? Ask him. He's no respecter of person. The point we need to remember is God does not dig up our past. Amen to that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, he knows what we've been through. He knows what we've done. And, but he's not going to condemn us for it. Um, condemnation will come in the future if we turn from him. But God does not dig up our past, no matter how bad it is. He looks at us as though we had never sinned. And uh, when we repent and accept by faith what he did for us in Christ, God treats us as though we had never sinned. Amen. This is from Steps to Christ. If you have given yourself to Him and accept Him as your Savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for His sake you are accounted righteous. If you give yourself to Him, ah, get the next one here. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. Hallelujah. Isn't that something? Amen. That is good news of the gospel. So a sinner can be justified only through faith in the atonement made in and through Christ who became a sacrifice for the sins of the entire guilty world. No one can be justified by any works of his own. No merit on our part. But he can be delivered from the guilt of sin, from the condemnation of the law, from the penalty of transgression, which is eternal death, and it's all by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ. Whatever he did, he did for us. He took our place. He was made to be sin himself for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And it's all by the suffering and death and resurrection of Christ on Calvary and Gethsemane, or probably his whole life. But God pardons the sinner, and we want to go to Romans 8. I want to 
look at the first verse and then the last three, three verses there also. We'll, we'll do it in a little bit. But God pardons the sinner. He remits the, uh, the punishment that we deserve. He treats us as though we had never sinned. He receive, receives us into divine favor. Justifies us through the merits of Christ's righteousness. God looks at us filtered through Christ. Christ stands, he circles us, and, he, and he's formed within as the hope of glory. So God looks at us just as if I'd always believed. Just as if I'd always obeyed. Just as if I'd never sinned. I don't think you're going to forget this, are you? No. <laughs> it is, I tell you, it's a concept that we just need to wrap our minds around. We can't. Now, we need to remember that we are never justified by keeping the law. Neither are we justified from keeping the law. We are justified in order to keep the law. Mm. If we keep the prepositions in their proper position, <laughs> we're not getting, we won't be befuddled. But it's by, from, and to. And we, when we surrender ourselves to Christ, God treats us as though we had always obeyed, always believed, and never sinned. I, I really can't wrap my little mind around that. But I believe it. And I say, Lord, help my unbelief. <laughs> because uh, this is the way it is. Again, just as if I'd always believed, just as if I'd always obeyed, just as if I had never sinned. What, and he, he does not dig up our past as bad as it's been. It's a marvelous thing. That, uh, whoever thought of that it had to be divine. It couldn't have been human. Now let's go to the book of Romans. And I think we'll probably uh, close with this. Uh, this has been short, but hopefully sweet. But Romans chapter 8. And we find in chapter 8 it begins with no condemnation. And it ends with no separation. Um, chapter 8 and verse 1. I'm too far here. Uh, therefore, he says in verse 8, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk after the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And this is talking about those who have accepted Christ. The Holy Spirit is filling them, and there's no condemnation. Then, if we drop down, probably about verse 35, probably 34, probably 32, how about 31? <laughs> the rest of the chapter, I was thinking the last four verses, but this is a good place to start. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Well, the one who brings the charge is the accuser of the brethren, the devil himself. He's the one who's making the charges. Verse 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he lists several things that are impossibly separated from him. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet of all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise the Lord. It begins with no condemnation, it ends with no separation. Mm. And this is what the third angel's message is, justification by faith. Especially verse 12 of chapter 14. The faith of Jesus. God looks at us as though we had never sinned. Amen. Absolutely amazing. And he wants us to give this message to the world. 
to those who want to hear. Some will not hear. But to those who will hear, they will enter into the joy of the Lord. And that's where our strength is. And you know, I just thought of another text, um, that God sings over us. Zephaniah. Oh, who said that? Zephaniah, yes, yes. Uh, I read uh, E.J. Wagner several years ago, and he was going to the, the three parables of chapter 15 of uh, Luke, talking about the lost sheep that was recovered, the coin that was recovered, and the son who came home after he left. And I said, he's saying, God, God sings over him. I said, oh, this can't be. Because I had my picture of God when he was a tyrant. Even after I accepted Christ, I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I still had reservation about God the Father. And the picture I had, I mean, in my mind, I'm, I'm projecting it backwards now on that, but you know these uh, the goalies that are, <laughs> uh, what do you call it? Ice hockey. Yes, hockey. And I pictured God as a goalie, and we were the pucks, <laughs> trying to keep us out the best we can. Oh, wow. And I thought we could sneak by him or home, home safe. Oh. There was another illustration I had. As a kid, uh, we used to have these long steel um, slides in the school. They were made of steel, and we would grease them with wax paper so that we could really go farther. And uh, as I thought back on, on that, I said, that's how I thought about God, that God waxed the slide to hell, and then put us on top and <laughs> put us down in there. Wow. It, it, I had a hard time with this. And, uh, but finally, I came to reading about God. God suffers with us. He bends from his throne. Surely read a passage this morning uh, for devotion. God leans from his throne looking down at us. The desire of ages has that picture also. And but it's things like this that we need to fill our minds with, I believe. But let's go to Zephaniah chapter 3. This is a judgment scene, by the way. And uh, uh, some people just squeal with delight <laughs> when they find out that this is the way God is in the judgment for his people. And starting with verse 11, where uh, yeah, the question is, I shall... I need to go to verse, uh, yeah, that's right, verse 11. In that day you shall not be ashamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. I will give, I will leave in the midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness, nor speak any lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. This is like Abraham and uh, David, the liars who God converted. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments, he has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. This is a picture of judgment. God is a just judge, and this, these are his people who are going to be judged favorably. He says, in that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear. Zion, let not your hands be weak. And then verse 17, and I'm going to read, I've got it in my margin here singing Savior uh, from uh, the King James. I like the way it goes. The Lord your God is in the midst of you. He is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. <laughs> Here's a statement. This is the testimony that the Lord desires us to bear to the world. And that's from the Review and Herald, 5-7-1908. And I've got a, I, think, I don't think a private interpretation of what is going to happen. When we picture 
the wedding in chapter 19 of Revelation. So after the wedding is taking place. So this has a union, full union between Christ and his people. It's going to be a big feed, but there's going to be a whole lot of singing going on. Mm -hmm. Think of it, all the people from every age, whatever color, race, background, whatever it is, they're all going to be singing praise to God. And then I believe this is going to happen. There's going to be silence. And God is going to break into a soul that's never been sung before. Mm. And he's going to be singing over all the people from every land. And I want to be there to hear it. Amen. Amen. And we'll join into that. Here's the, from Christ Father Blessed 207. Heaven and earth shall unite in the Father's song of rejoicing. Amen. What a time that will be. God rejoices over us now. There's a lot of heartache in heaven. But what gives him joy is to see someone turn to Christ. Amen. And when this is all over with, we're going to hear some singing we've never heard before. Amen. A divine song by a divine master. And then we get to take part in that. What a time. As I said before, I want to be there to hear it. All of us need to be there to hear it. Join in that course with, with God. And he'll be, he'll be thrilled with his very being because of it. Now I look at him and he, he wants me to be saved and you to be saved more than we even want to be. And he's, instead of trying to keep us out, he's trying to get us in. Yes. Thank God for that. And with that, I think we probably ought to quit. Pastor Jerry? Yes. Would you like to try to sing that song? I bet you some of us actually know that scripture song. Oh, really? Oh, really? Well, then come up and sing it. <laughs> well, I was going to try to do it with the piano. But you do have to open up your King James Bible. It's real close. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17. Yeah. Kind of goes like this. If I can get it low enough. Anybody ever sing this as a scripture song? Yeah. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy, with joy. He will rest in his love, he will joy over thee with singing. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Is mighty, is mighty. Surely you've sung this before? You're saying the words. <coughs> no, but I think um, our friend who has the scripture songs that he, he's reading out in the Ricky. School. Ricky and Colonel? No, oh. no, the one from the General Conference. Derek Morris? Derek. Oh, Derek. Let's go ahead and sing this again. We learned this a long time ago. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy, with joy. He will rest in his love.
Gracious Father, we thank you again. Thank you for the words, Amen. for the music of this song. And we pray that we'll learn it from the heart and break into singing and listen to you sing in heaven. Amen. What a time that will be. Amen. Thank you so much for the invitation and the means of getting there through Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Alrighty.